Guys, this week on Fat Man on Batman, there's no Kevin Smith, there's just me. And we're gonna talk about the Punisher, y'all. Come on back. Hi, it's Mark Bernardin. I lied a little bit before when I said it was just gonna be me here. I was true about Kevin not being here, because he's not, he's up in Vancouver getting all flashy, because that's what he's doing, and he didn't bring me, so I'm not bitter at all. It's fine, I'll stay here and send in Los Angeles while he's freezing his ass off in Canada, which probably isn't freezing because it's Canada and it's whatever, spring, I guess. Um, but no, I'm not by myself, because today we're talking about the Punisher, and we got one of the most foremost Punisher experts in the world, and I can tell you this because she actually directed a Punisher movie, which I haven't done, and Kevin hasn't done. So we have experts in the house. Ms. Lexi Alexander is with me. What? Yay! <laughs> Hello. Mm. You know, this is not uh, what I actually foresaw when I said I'm coming after Kevin Smith's job. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I actually thought I would be in Vancouver directing The Flash. But you know, yeah, I am. <laughs> never say never. No, I'm just kidding. The <laughs> Fla Flash is Kevin territory. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't think you've gone on the YouTube and cried vociferously over watching an episode of Flash. I, I have not, and I actually admire him for that. Not only do I admire him, I mention it in every interview that I admire admit that I cried about something, I will end this interview by saying, and just by the way, Kevin Smith cries about The Flash. <laughs> See, that seems to be the way to get a job directing The Flash, is just cry. Yeah, I, I, I guess. Yeah, so bad luck. I don't think I'll be doing The Flash. Oh, well, well. But I'm good. <laughs> well, that's all right. I can't wait for his episode. Everybody's really excited, and yeah, so I am mean, I. I just keep seeing the Instagram feeds, again, not bitter, uh, yeah. of him having the best time in the world. It's like, hey, here's me and Muse, and here's you know everybody in Star Labs, and hey, here's the Hall of Justice, and hey, he's like, all right, you have fun. <laughs> that's okay. Well, if I ever go on another superhero set again, you have to come visit me. Fair enough. <laughs> Done. It's a day. One of three powers activate. Yay! All right, so we're going to get into it a little bit with Lexi and talk about first, you know, tell me your story. Where did you, where, where did you come from? What's your secret origin? Uh, well, my secret origin is um, I am both Palestinian and German, which mm. makes me the utmost stereotypical antagonist <laughs> on today's TV and movie screens. <laughs> and also, like, you know, the 80s. Well, I, I don't think we have surpassed the 80s much, but we're trying, we're trying, we're trying. Um, so, um, I, but I grew up in Germany, and um, yeah, and then I came to Hollywood in, in the mid-90s or late 90s. Mm. Um, Did you always want to be a filmmaker when you were No. Kid? I was a martial artist. Um, mm -hmm. I had just won the world championship, kickboxing championship, and it was actually Chuck Norris was one of a few uh, martial artists who sponsored my green card. Mm. Um, and the idea was it was still in a time where those B-movies that martial artists did, that there was a career for martial artists who, who kind of walked in that circle. There is a whole shelf of like Cynthia Rothrock movies. Don like, the Dragon Wilson, oh, you know, sweet like Don yeah. the Dragon. So we so <laughs> the idea was kind of like I guess everybody thought Lexi would turn into like the female chocolate Van Damme, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, he even sent me to a very well known, very strict New York acting school which I spent three years at. It was called the Joanne Baron D.W. Brown uh, Studio of Dramatic Arts. It was really kind of Stanislavski, Meisner, very New York strict. I did that, but I never felt like I should be in front of the camera. Like, mm. I, I always thought, like, all I'm doing is waiting around, and people come and tell me what to do. This is so not me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I knew that I wanted to be a director, but didn't know how to go about it. Also, I don't come from a rich family, so there was no way for me to go to USC or anything. Um, so I, I figured I should do a short film, and in, in, until then I should try to survive by doing stunts. So mm. I became a stunt woman first, um, and then you know basically saved money to do this short film. Uh, in which movies did you did you were you the fall girl? I actually was in Batman and Robin. Not a lot of people know that. And Joel <laughs> Shoemaker fired me. It's a very interesting story. <laughs> Badge uh, of honor. Yeah, Tell it me. is. Well, um, we there was this scene. It was actually a really short scene in the end cut, but I worked on it for at least six weeks until I got fired and some, somebody replaced me and worked even longer, right? <laughs> but it, do you remember when a Poison Ivy and uh, Mr. Freeze go into this like empty swimming pool and there's these golems? 
Yes. with the whip chains. Uh -huh. So I was one of the golems with the whip chains. And as a matter of fact, I was the only one who knew how to use the whip chain. I had to teach, all the others were guys, right? Mm. And I had to actually teach some of the guys who, who were not familiar with the whip chain how to do it. Here's an interesting trivia that I don't think I've ever told anybody. The main actor in this, who wasn't a stunt person, who was an actor, was Doug Hutchison. Doug Hutchison, and so when I got fired, uh, for no reason, like literally, I didn't do anything wrong. The one thing was we had these contact lenses that we had to put in because he did that black light thing, mm -hmm. and I really had trouble getting these contact lenses in my eyes. Like, my eye just rejected it all the time, and the makeup people who were there just for that job were getting frustrated because I, I it, they would have to wait for me because of these black light things mm. right but you know that really wasn't my fault but Joel Schumacher I don't know he, he like all of a sudden it was like we don't need a girl in this group at all let's replace her with a guy <laughs> literally get replaced by a dude <laughs> who didn't know how to use the whip chain either and Doug Hutchison who played the male comment sent me this beautiful card saying how horrible the industry is and how how sorry it is and then when Punisher came around, I hired him as LBJ. I <laughs> cast him, and we had a great time. That's awesome. Yeah. So how did the, you said you made a, a short film? Yeah, made a short film about a boxer, um, which was based on a true story that I experienced back home uh, when I, I grew up, obviously, in boxing rings and gyms. And, and uh, that was nominated for an Oscar, and that kind of broke me into the industry. You mm -hmm. know, I did a movie after that about, uh, you know, kind of the um, British soccer hooligan firms. Yeah, Green Street hooligans. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, after that, I was kind of hailed as like, oh, my God, Hollywood is going to come knocking. This is the best thing we've seen since sliced bread. And I kept waiting for the knock. Was like, <laughs> somebody supposed to be knocking? <laughs> and I kept interviewing for certain films. I mean, I went up for all the films that every, every, all the dudes went up for. And, um, you know, uh, essentially, uh, I, there was an offer <laughs> to do The Punisher. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very interesting because I passed like three times at mm. least, you know. Um, I didn't think that I was right for it. Um, you know, I was also really intimidated by it because they had already one had already been done or there two had been done but the one that was well known was the Thomas Jane one and it didn't go so well and so I was like I don't know I don't know this all seems a bit like not something I would be doing um, and then you know there was a whole thing about you know you have you know how it is you have agents who say well, you really got to do that studio film, Lexi, and that's the only offer we have for you. <laughs> <laughs> so now, what what ultimately made you say, or what ultimately made you comfortable saying yes to that? I mean, I understand the career decisions, like I got to make a movie, and this is the movie they're going to let mm. me make. But from an artistic perspective, like what was the way in for you in that character? Um, <clears throat> well. Um, Here's a here's a funny thing. I actually, uh, they, Marvel ended up sending me a box of comic books, mm -hmm. and I started reading about it. And um, I'm a huge, I was always a huge Rambo fan. I like the Rambo movies, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, that's where Rambo came from. Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially, because the, the series that I had, uh, I think that I really kind of was drawn to Garth Ennis's series, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was a lot about Vietnam, how he psychologically felt coming back from that, uh, the post traumatic stress syndrome, and then. And, you know, uh, basically, how's a guy who has a good heart, but who is hardened up and who, who just is sick of, you know, the scum of the world, you know, how does that represent itself? And also, I don't know if you remember this, there was one called Punisher Tiger, mm. and that was all about the poem. The Blake's mm. Tiger poem, which was mm. all about, you know, 400 pounds in a cage with rage. And, and it was just really, and then this was an origin story about how uh, the Punisher at like 12 years old, loving this poem, argues with his priest about mm. how God didn't make tigers. It was this really beautiful thing about, and how he was surrounded by criminals and uh, one of his classmates, a girl, gets raped uh, and commits suicide. And he ends up watching her brother go after him and kill him and that was like his original story and I related to I mean that that was for me it was like oh my god this is a great character how have I not heard about this mm. in other aspects it goes a little bit into silliness um, you know I didn't like all of the versions that were created um, but I think the essence uh, of this kind of Rambo type vigilante like you, you drive a man too far mm. a man who is like a one man army mm. <laughs> you're gonna get killed <laughs> you know and I also love I, I 
you know, I got to be honest with you. I know we're going to talk a little bit about Dare Table and Punisher. I, I you know, I, personally, this whole like, but I'm not going to kill. And I know that is that is the mythology of some of these guys, but is not my thing. Like, I, I mean, I'm. I, you know, I I enjoy a movie. Where <laughs> I enjoy murder. <laughs> yeah, I do. Well, you know, we we talk. This is our ultimate fantasy. I mean, look, the movie Taken. That's where where why everybody related to that. Like, there's just certain people in this world where we would be better off if they won't be around. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, it, it it becomes dodgy because who's who's the judge? Who's the jury? Who's the executioner? And that that was the thing about Punisher and and the kind of gray zone area. Like, what what if you make a mistake deciding, you know, right. who's bad. And I, but I also love that about it. But I personally, this, this, this whole thing about, well, this hero is going to have to go his entire storyline about whatever we do thing without killing anybody. It, it takes it almost, it's a little bit like it takes the edge off for me. Like if I know I'm watching a hero for 12 episodes who's never going to kill somebody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sorry. But, but, you know, they're to that point, like, and, and and of course, this is a thing that that nerds like us have talked about for a long time. Is Superman, I mean, and Batman for that matter. Like, you know, if just Batman killed the Joker, like everything gets better. Everything gets like forty percent better in Gotham mm-hmm. if there's no Joker. And he should see this. Like, he's a logical man. He's a detective. He understands the way cause and effect works. Mm-hmm. So for him to make that decision to not do that feels ridiculous. But there's also heroes. I mean, Superman being the prime prime version of that is you kind of don't want him to kill people. You want him to be better than everybody else. You it's want true, and I feel that, for example, about Supergirl. Like I can't even imagine her, you mm. know, murdering some. But again, like that's why there's a variety of these guys. Right. You know, with somebody like the Punisher who has a military background, and you know, if we're going based on the uh, the, the basically backstory that I used in Punisher Warzone, or that was in, that it was in the script uh, <laughs> by Nick Santora. Um, um, uh, you know, the idea that he basically watched his wife and kids get killed. Mm. You know, I mean, I don't want to see this guy go 90 minutes and then go, okay, but I'm not going to kill you. You know, I mean, honestly, it's it's like I, I, you know, I'm waiting for the mayhem and the like, okay, you've driven this man too right. too far. Like, I guess some of that depends on just the movie you're trying to tell, mm-hmm. the story you're trying to tell. And The Punisher is a revenge story, and revenge stories don't come to completion unless there's actual revenge. Exactly. You know. You're right. That is the difference. Yeah. I mean, where the Punisher story is not revenge. I'm I'm sorry. Daredevil's story is not revenge. Superman's story is not revenge. Yeah. Batman's story kind of is, but they just don't ever do it. So it's always like, we're at third base, you guys. Yeah. But we're not going to kill anybody. So, okay. Tell me about the, the, the casting of Ray. Uh, Ray Stevenson. Um, as Ray Punisher. Stevenson was brought up by Kevin Feige in the first meeting that I had with him. Um, you know, it was he was sitting there and said, "Do you know who Ray Stevenson is?" I hadn't watched Rome, so I said no, and he said, "You should watch Rome." I went home, I watched Rome. I'm like, "That, that guy, guy is perfect." <laughs> you know? That guy, yes, please. Yeah, um, oh, look at and him. I thought that was a really good choice. And then it became a little bit, um, you know, because you know Ray, you know wasn't necessarily like a massive name um, and so it became a little bit like now we have to like cast certain parts around it you know that stuff is always slightly annoying <laughs> you know <laughs> here's the perfect guy yeah, because as a director you 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 end up seeing actors and you audition them and uh, nobody tells you while well, you're auditioning them but they're not really getting the parts so and so gets cast because cross promotion you know like you know and it I was very happy with the cast I had but uh, you know, I wonder, I mean, obviously since then I haven't made a, a comic book movie, but I wonder like how many directors are in, in that in that position where, you know, they have to cast certain mm-hmm. actors, you know? Yeah, I mean, I sort of feel like, at least especially with Marvel, Marvel is at the point now where they're their own brand. Like you are coming because it's a Marvel movie. It kind of, not to say it doesn't matter who's in it, but you don't have to get Denzel Washington mm-hmm. to be Black Panther because it's a Marvel movie. Like yeah. you can then just get the best guy for the role. Like nobody aside from Downey Jr. is a box office anything right. until, oh, it's Thor. Now I want Thor in my boating movie. And oh, Cap, now right. I want Cap in this movie. It's, I'm showing up for Marvel in the same way you show up for Pixar right. and to a certain degree Disney. 
you know, so I feel like that sort of thing has receded a little bit and given directors a little bit more latitude in casting. Which I think is great because, um, you know, I, I feel like that's also where we can bring a little bit of inclusion and diversity in and, like, not go with, you know, like, the, the obvious choice, right. you know? Although, you know, the Marvel Universe and the DC Universe are incredibly pale. <laughs> and, you and, tell me, I know. <laughs> and, I know. And a little bit bro-ish. <laughs> yeah, a little bit is, is an understatement. Oh, yes. And then it's the constant discussion of, like, where the hell is the damn merchandise for Black Widow? Why is she not in this box? Mm. And, like, oh, my God. And you know me. I'm, like, I get all of this in my timeline. Have you seen this? Mm. Black Widow is not in this box again. I'm, like, I mean, how, how many? I, I, I'm just tired of getting upset about it, you know? I know. Like, the, 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 that sort of callousing that you get when you're constantly confronted is, like, I know. I know. It's every Black History Month. I get the, hey, so we're talking about black writers and comics. Like, I know. We've talked about it every February for the last 10 years. I know. The narrative hasn't really changed. There and, you know, been. we don't want to talk about it all the time. That's the thing. I mean, I, the, the problem is if we don't do it, nobody does it, you know. Right. And so we have to do it. But I wish people would understand what, what a burden it is to actually. N none of us in the industry, want. we all want to just play and write scripts <laughs> and make movies and play around and not think about any kind of injustices. But unfortunately, we were not born into that path. <laughs> you know, so we actually have to go out there and make some noise, at least to make it better for the generation coming behind us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I'm all about. Like, I don't want young girls graduating film school and walking into what I walked into um, but it's annoying and it's like people sometimes email this to me or tweet it at me as if I'm getting like a Christmas gift and for me it's just <laughs> like oh my god who did this again and you know who who uh, cut you know the actress out of this movie and who it's like I get all the messages about <laughs> all of that <laughs> uh, okay so Warzone comes out mm -hmm. uh, I, I saw it I, I remember sitting there in a screening going I think, did that dude's head just turn into mist? Are we in a misting head zone now? Because this is kind of awesome. What was the reaction from from your end when, mm -hmm. it, when it hit the public? Well, I was concerned because they had moved the date from, we were done fairly early, but they had moved it from fall to uh, December. And I was really concerned about that because I thought, is this a December movie? Mm. Um, the marketing department of Lionsgate did not want to hear a single word from me. Like they just were, and apparently I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not the only director that has experienced that. I just it didn't because I, I didn't have any experience working with the studio. I didn't commute. Like I, I it, you know, I thought like I've lived with this movie and the fan community because I really went into the chat rooms and contacted the fan community to mm -hmm. get as much information as possible. I lived with, with this community and with this movie now for almost eighteen months why would you not hear listen to me like I knew that had we had a special screening for people like you and Patton Oswald and Kevin who all have reacted favorably to the movie I mean mm. Patton wrote a review that's how I met him mm. I didn't know him then but he wrote a review that just is unbelievable I don't think he's ever written a review like that for any other movie you know how he stood on the chair and screamed at the screen and, and he's been talking the story about that for a few years now um, so had we just taken some opinion make who know comic books and mm -hmm. comic book movies and had shown them a movie and told them this is what it is, I think it would have gone completely differently. Most comic book fans didn't even know there was a Punisher movie in the theater. We were up against all the Academy Award uh, uh, movies. Yeah. December's right? the perfect time for Punisher. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And um, then, you know, what actually was interesting was we screened my cut for Marvel and Lionsgate and like all the people, I guess you, you go to Lionsgate and they have a screening of it and there's the whole room is full. So I'm assuming these are all people who work for the marketing department and for Marvel. And, and, and that room was on fire. Like they were screaming and clapping. And I, I felt like a I, I felt like I had a proper like super career after that because everybody, I remember the partners at the agency, I was suddenly calling me much more often. <laughs> um, it, it was really interesting until the weekend after it came out and they basically, none of them even remembered my name anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, it was a great screening for them. And I think based on that great screening and how they felt about the movie, they said, set up these two screenings in New York and LA for basically mainstream critics. Mm. 
and you now being a very famous and important <laughs> LA Times critic. <laughs> but you know, they were not like you. Mm. I mean, I think a lot of critics don't actually know uh, comic books. No. So imagine them walking into this. I actually panicked so much. I knew what would be happening. I panicked so much. I said, could we at least put a sheet on each paper that shows that I actually took the frames from the movie exactly, mm -hmm. that this has a source material that I tried to be very faithful to. And they just laughed about me. Like, we've done this for 20 years. We know what we're doing. We're not doing that. And you read the <laughs> reviews. I never forget the guy in the San Francisco Chronicle said, Lexi Alexander has an imagination for which she should go to prison. <laughs> which I'm now using in my director's reel. I mean, I absolutely would too, because yeah, that's I, amazing. But, I mean, how can you misunderstand? <laughs> like, he actually thought I came up with all that, like the kick on the head and the fence and all of that, not understanding that I was being incredibly faithful to source material, to the point where I imitated the violence literally by frame, by mm. colors, by action, by everything. The exploded heads, the shooting off the head, the hole in the head, it was all... We actually, on my blog, I had the sheets next to some of the shots. And um, and so it's, I think the reviews just were so, so bad. Then on top of it, the people who really would like the movie, uh, you know, didn't even know it was out there. And then a year later or so, uh, Patton called me and said, can you come on you know, this podcast with me and then can we screen um, Punisher in my festival, Deep End to the Darkness? Mm -hmm. um, and so we went on, uh, how did this get made? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which are great guys. <laughs> and we talked about it. And then we went, uh, I went to the movie theater where he always has his Deep End to the Darkness festival. People were standing around the block. Like mm -hmm. we, could, we could have sold tickets for weeks to go. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And they were all in the Q&A. They all said, we had no idea this movie was out. Had we heard Patton talk about it before like that, we all would have come. Wow. So it bittersweet, bittersweet, you know. Mm. But I think over the years, I mean, I can also see on my residual checks, it's done really well. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay, so after, after Punisher, how did you get back into the comic book orbit? Um, well, you know what, what was really interesting is that I really connected with the comic book world after Punisher. Um, mm. Once I started using Twitter properly, um, and you know, started making friends. I, I started realizing I've I made friends with comic book writers much more than I made. Like I actually personally don't like a lot of people on film Twitter, <laughs> so-called hashtag film Twitter. Uh, I'm like I block all of them and I block them purpose. I don't only mute them. I block them just so I can block, them, just so they can go on my side and say oh, I'm blocked. Yeah, as, as Kevin every now and again will just deploy a kablock, kablock, right. kablock. <laughs> I'm gonna use that. It's just like also because they're so entitled that it just it just uh, it, it like this is my favorite thing blocking people. And I think it's because I don't really fight in my, in life as much anymore. This is the this is your fight club. <laughs> I can only block this. I wish Twitter would have a punching button, right? But it doesn't. It has only a block, so I just block, 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 block. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, but I'm friends with, uh, you know, first of all, Twain Swarzynski and mm -hmm. I did like, like this little short film which was kind of a disappointing experience because they really didn't have a lot of money to do anything, but working with him was amazing. Um, uh, you know, I'm friends with Gail Simone um, mm -hmm. and uh, Dan Slott. I mean, there's there's so many, um, uh, Greg Rucker, I try, I'm, mm -hmm. every week I go and try and get one of his properties to adapt, like oh. literally, I'm sending every, I'm so much after him, like he probably thinks I'm a stalker. And That's he's very, I, I am as well, that's okay. Yeah, he's very good about it. We've actually talked, I mean, I, I think we already would would have. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to adapt Stumptown, uh, mm -hmm. and I think we were already would have something going because he really liked Queen Street and stuff. Except that he is so busy, and uh, yeah. it just, it just, um, even with agents involved, it has never. We have never managed to get something together. But I, I also, you know, you know, Mark, you follow me on Twitter. Mm -hmm. If you follow me, you, you know, kind of what you're getting. You know, <laughs> like I'm. I don't only talk about inclusion and diversity, and you know how we need to like stop the frat and the pro mm -hmm. club. I scream and fight it, you know, like I'm actually out there really saying this this just needs to stop. Frankly, and I don't care. I will scream it until it ends, you know, when I do have time to scream it. And it, people follow me, when people from the comic book industry follow me, it's because they they are like-minded. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, otherwise you just don't follow me. Yeah, and many people choose not to, but I feel like in the comic book industry there are so many of them who are on the right side of this. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that 
comics is a small enough industry, especially the people who are making comics. There's, you know, two, three, four hundred people in the world who can make that a job mm -hmm. and like pay their bills by doing it. And the barrier between those people and their audience is incredibly thin. You know, like you cannot just roll up on David Fincher at a convention and talk to him for a while. You can't buy Meryl Streep a beer. I mean, you probably could. She'd drink it, but just getting access to her is that much harder. Yeah. Whereas a comic convention, you go to the right bar, you can run into all of Marvel. Mm -hmm. You can run into all of Image. Mm -hmm. And they're totally cool because they're just like you, except that they've gotten the chance to do the thing that they love. Right. Which also happens to be the thing that you love. Um, and yeah, they're all very, you know, not to say thin-skinned, but they wear their hearts in their sleeves because, mm -hmm. I mean, they're creators, they're artists, and you have to be that way. That's, I think that's why I've, I'm bonding with all of them. And, like, I'm always, I, I make a comment about this every week. It stuns me that I have more friends now in that world than I have in actual film world, you know. Um, I also think they're a lot less arrogant sometimes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I think that comes, you know, from being, I think they're still more in the nerd and geek world than mm -hmm. some of the directors that we pretend are nerds, but not really. Come on, you know they're the quarterback and they're the jock. Like, <laughs> stop with the no, stop with the nerd thing. So I, this is this is my world, and so I've been in that in that world. I've never been able to, and you know, this is also the kind of community. And so I'm talking now just about the writers, but there's also a tremendous amount of fans. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, first of all, the other day I went on Twitter Analytics, which I didn't even know existed. Like yeah, that's I, the whole thing. I checked. Like I'm like, wait a minute, this actually splits my followers into gender and. I mean, I have 70% male and only 30% female hmm. followers. Like that, that's that's <laughs> unbelievable to me. But that's, I think, a lot of that is from the the comic book community and Punisher fans and Queen Street fans. And I think that this is something Patton Oswalt always says says to me. Um, we were talking about doing, he always said I should do TV, comic mm -hmm. book shows, TVs. And I said, Patton, you say that as if I could just call these people up. Like, they're not interested in me. Uh, they don't care about me doing TV. And he says, uh, you know, he, he was talking, but they, he actually said, he said, but they're all stealing your look and they're all <laughs> using stuff from me. And I said, I know, but that's a, and he said, he, I said to him, you know, the comic book fans are, actually badly want me to do some of this stuff. I said, it's amazing that they're so less discriminating than some of the executives and gatekeepers we have in Hollywood. And he said, because here's why. They don't care if a sock puppet directs <laughs> one of their characters, <laughs> if, if it's done well. And I will never forget that because it's so true, mm -hmm. you know? They have, a, they have a real like love and respect for somebody who treats a character well. And yeah, they I love that. Do. And TV is a weird thing in that, you know, I remember listening to, to, to Clooney talk about being on ER versus being in movies. It's like TV is an intimate thing. Like TV is a thing that you're inviting into your bedroom with you. Mm -hmm. You know, and the bond you form with a character supersedes the bond you form with whoever makes that thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and TV is a, is a writer's medium in the way that film is a director's medium. And yeah, like, and Kevin was talking about it going up to Ken. It's like, you know what? If I got hit by a train tomorrow, my episode of Flash would still happen. Mm -hmm. Like, they can do it without me. They know exactly how to make this train run. I'm just a guy who's like waving at people out of the, the caboose, going, hey, wouldn't it be fun if he did that? Sure, <laughs> Kevin, it'd be great if he did that. We're also so going to do this because this is the way it has to go. This is the good part and the bad part about TV. I mean, first of all, I think Kevin underestimates how important he is mm -hmm. for showing up on a show like that. I mean, they were talking about that the minute they heard, you know, it's like a big deal for them for Kevin to want to do a Flash episode, you know. Uh, uh, for the rest of us peasants, <laughs> we we show up and and you know everybody's like, okay, what's she gonna do that's gonna annoy us and bring us home late, right? <laughs> I mean, not not all, but I mean, the, the director on TV really is replaceable, rightly so. They have there is an engine that runs every week, and um, the main actors, you know, know the character inside out. They know it more than you do because you you cannot even catch up on right. how much they've done on this uh, I mean unless it's something like the flash and you know Kevin has probably read everything about the flash it's a different thing but overall and uh, you know it's a good side and a bad side I haven't really decided I was really high on TV uh, at first now I'm starting to to understand you know a little bit more of how 
I mean, the director is just not important. <laughs> just oh, not. you. No, no. You know, it it I, is like, <laughs> I mean, if, if I would get hit by the train, they'll probably be like, oh, okay, we have some so-and-so is on the list next. Right, you know? yeah, one less seat on the transpo van. Yeah, that's okay. exactly. I mean, that that is literally how it is, you know? And, and look, it has to be like that. I mean, it's changing a little bit in a sense, and this is really cool. Um, there's a term that I've just recently learned. They call it journeyman. Do you know mm-hmm. what that is? Mm-hmm. The director that have done TV so long, they literally yeah. like paralyzed in the chair. They don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they refer to as the dudes that have been doing this for 30 some years. Yeah, they like, d- my first credit is on the Rockford Files. <laughs> yeah. And he's showing up to do an episode of Limitless. <laughs> and by the way, it was hard to break that. You know, mm. like we're just now, and that's not because we made noise. I think it's because showrunners are kind of hipper and cooler and kind of started saying, we don't want these journeymen anymore. Right. Um, and so that's kind of cool, but uh, you know, uh, with a lot of us, <laughs> we also, you know, it's not like they replaced the entire crew. Okay, mm. there's still a lot of people who have done TV for a long time, and you walking into something because the showrunner thinks I like to have fresh, cool directors <laughs> who do little mini features, <laughs> and yet you walking into a crown where everybody's like this. Fuck, don't you dare do a feature. <laughs> we have seven days. Seven days for this. You and your fancy crane shots and I know. martial arts. <laughs> Listen, you don't know how close you are. I can't say anything, though. I know, she won't say anything. <laughs> I still uh, need to keep working. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about <clears throat> Daredevil, season mm-hmm. two. Yeah. Which brings the Punisher to television. I, uh, I am, Kevin and I will probably go into this far deeper, far later, because Kevin will have thoughts, as Kevin always has thoughts. Dying to hear his thoughts. Yeah. For me, it, uh, that season, this season, sings when the Punisher's on screen. The Punisher is like the salt you need in an amazing recipe. Without it, you totally notice it's not there. When it's there, everything kind of pops and tastes better. When he's not there, it's, it's a little flat. Like, Electra. I love the character of Elektra. I don't love this portrayal of the character of Elektra. Mm. You know, and what they're trying to do is trying to make her seem like the, the, the dame from the past who's dragging bad influence. She was Miss Bad Attitude, and she's bringing me back down to where I used to be as a kid when everything was shitty, and, and I was a bad person. But it seems like bad person Matt was not that bad of a person, and not that different of a person. His, yeah. his hair was well, looser. That's what we were talking about before. Like, there's a kind of, like, he's going to always be the the... The, the superhero with uh, a moral code, mm-hmm. and he was that then, and he is that now. He really wasn't a bad guy. Yeah, you know? like, and that's sort of what I wanted to see. Like, if you're going to yeah. show me this woman who is is forcing Matt to do things that he doesn't want to do, you need to show me the pull that she had on him, the, right. the the sort of hooks that she can sink into him to drag him back to when he drank too much and got into like rogue fights and maybe killed a dude once and that's where he drew his line. Now that would be crazy. That would be interesting. That would be, that would be super this is a femme fatale that I actually understand why yeah. she's fatal. Yeah. You know, but I'm watching like Matt Murdock and Frank Castle on a rooftop and Frank Castle just spitting dialogue, a monologue for like eight minutes. And it's fucking amazing. Yeah, he. I mean, he had me at that monologue. I mean, I think he had everybody. You know, I, I'm at the point, God, I don't even know if I should say this, but fuck it, I'm going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I feel like we just need to take all, all the footage of Frank Castle out <laughs> <laughs> and do its own job, because I was at the point where I was just forwarding to see mm-hmm. him. Like every, and and I, that could just be my own preference. And first of all, I mean, for somebody who has made a Punisher movie, he had to convince me. And I, I mean, I think he is amazing at it. Mm-hmm. And when he did that, I mean, by the way, not only does he like <laughs> stab 15 people <laughs> to death, spoiler, sorry, <laughs> but um, he gives love advice at some point. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> and by you can't the, protect the red! <laughs> and by the way, it, like, it's not stupid. You know, like, it's actually not, um, he, he, I mean, when he has this whole, a scene with with her talking about if you love some sort of they take a hold of it I was sitting there going this could have gone really wrong this could have gone really wrong you wrote him giving love advice and it worked because he is great and there was even moments like when he is first comes into the trial and that music they have mm-hmm. and his I was like that's the 12 episodes I want to see of this only you know 
So the other part of it, I have to say, by the way, let's just talk a quick thing, a shout out to Philip Severa, who does all the fight scenes, mm. who's a great fight choreographer. Um, and who, I mean, who really knows his shit. Obviously, he was praised in the first season. Yeah. But in my opinion, I don't know if it's just because the other stuff, it just gets too much for me, the ninja stuff. And I also, you know, I'm very, when there's a kid fighting or a woman fighting, mm. you, you have to design the fight choreography in a way that people buy it, right. you know? And, and kicking a guy who's twice your weight, I have done it, that is not gonna move, you know? <laughs> I mean, and that's, it bothers me so much. And I think people who don't know fighting disconnect at some point. Mm. And the ninja stuff, it all got a little bit too much for me. But man, when Punisher was on it, like that that prison fight uh, is uh, one of the best fights ever choreographed, you yeah, know? Yeah, it, it is so strong. My, I, I'm of two minds of it. I kind of would love to see a Punisher series with John Barenthal as a Punisher. But I'm also of the maybe he's best deployed, like the Hulk was in, in the Marvel movies, as a supporting character to make everything a little bit better. No. He, no! Needs, his, he needs his own job, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I mean, if you actually read the amount of like the Garth Ennis stuff, that all the Maxis, what, what did the richness that's out there, also the Rucker series, mm. and bringing uh, Rachel Cole Alvers in, is that her name? I think so. Oh my God! I mean, but there's so endless stuff to tell, and I think he's so compelling. I could watch him for twenty hours doing, giving love advice. <laughs> or, I want to see Love Line with Frank Castle. Or, or sitting just in a prison cell and just and, hold her hand, man. Just hold her fucking hand. <laughs> Come on. Buy her some goddamn flowers, <laughs> Rick. <laughs> it was fucking great. He was like, "You find that love, you hold on to it." And and it was like, I, I literally was sitting there like, that was risky. That was risky. And if he wouldn't be such a good actor, boy, yeah. that could have gone. I, I, I would have not. I would have not had the balls to do that. I would have not <laughs> given Ray Stevenson's line that says, "You need to hold on to that love." <laughs> Remember what her birthday is, man. That's the important shit. Damn it, Red. <laughs> <laughs> this is not how we talk. In case you haven't seen the show, this is not. This is not how John Bernthal talks at all. But I really not want that show to exist. Dear, <laughs> dear Lifetime, I'm gonna pitch you a little. I'm gonna call it like a meet cute series with the Punisher and a lovely young lady. He's Would you like to go to a dance? <laughs> Jill. <laughs> yeah, I'll give him like a, do he like moonlights as a talk show host where he gets calls about <laughs> people's yeah. love life. What's your problem, caller? <laughs> Damn it, son. <laughs> Just kiss that girl. Oh, man. But uh, listen, it worked. And to me, I mean, I, I, I can't believe you don't want a show. Like, that's all I want. I'm starting a petition for the show, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> I mean, it will exist. I mean, it's, it's clear that yeah. they're setting him up. I mean, he's so good in it that it feels like it's at this point a no-brainer. Yeah. I am just of the, you know, although I've also said before when they were talking about making more Hobbit movies, I'm like, listen, if Peter Jackson makes pizza and he's offering me like nine slices of pizza as opposed to six slices of pizza, it's still pizza. And I love pizza. So why complain? Yeah. But. <laughs> then you saw the Hobbit Then I saw the Hobbit movies. I'm like, you know what? Maybe a salad. Yeah. <laughs> a salad might be okay. Possibly. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm just knowing full well what could happen with too much Punisher. And I also feel like the Punisher is, and, and I'm not that deep into the books as you are, but there's something nice about him as a force of nature. There's something nice about him as this like undeniable just just wave that sweeps through things and destroys like a hurricane. I don't know if I want that much character development from my forces of nature and to have to evolve that character over time. Like I want him to always be the Punisher. I want him to right. be that character who is frozen in time and that time is pain and tragedy. And mm. when you evolve past that, he stops being the thing that I love. You know, I mean, I, I love that he struggles with uh, what he's doing, actually. And I felt like that really came out in that monologue, too. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I actually, the version that I did was much more he resigned to it and nobody will ever talk him out of it. Whereas this version, there's actually, at some point, there was a comic book where Spider-Man uh, was talking to the Punisher. And Spider-Man, during that time, was, was uh, kind of haunted by what he was doing, even though it wasn't nearly as close <laughs> to what Punisher. But he said to the Punisher, I thought I was haunted by my choices. But my problems compared to yours are like a birthday party. And I never forget that, because I think that's really, that's really true. He's on a level where, like, I mean, he, he, he basically, uh, 
you know, is that that famous thing? If you if you look into the abyss too long, be careful that mm -hmm. you don't turn into a monster while mm -hmm. working with monsters. What does right. that say? Like if you if you stare into the abyss, the abyss will stare back at you. Yeah, but he turned into the in in a way he has turned into the guys he's fighting. Although mm -hmm. he justifies it by you know them basically you know he's on the good and they on the bad. But I, I love that he is not completely resigned to this. I would love to see him struggle more with that mm. choice. Maybe even, and that's what I think is interesting, what if you back up from that a little bit and suddenly, because I can tell you as a fighter, you know, that is actually a real thing of like, you know, when there's a phase where you, where you uh, trying to soften your style, you're trying not to be such an asshole during the competitions and stuff. <laughs> you know, so, uh, the soldiers, Marines go through that training. Sweep the leg, Johnny! <laughs> Basically. <laughs> but, but there's a thing about, you know, where you take one step back and you're suddenly so vulnerable to everything. Mm. Like, if you change a single thing, all of a sudden everything is messed up and people beating you left and right. And so to me, that's interesting. Like, what if he actually is convinced by somebody who comes into his life or somebody, something that happens to take a step back and maybe, you know, not be full of rage? And mm. that almost kills him. Like, suddenly everything falls apart because if he's not in that state of rage, he's not the punisher. Mm. I think that would be great. Yeah, like, what is, what is that dude's real life like if he's not that thing? and what happens to the world around him if he backs away from it. Right. Like That is kind of fascinating. I would like to see that. You've changed my mind. Look guys, we did a thing today. We changed the dude's mind yeah. about the Punisher. That's what I do. Yay, changing minds, winning hearts, breaking souls. Giving love advice. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so was there anything else that you were fond of in the Punisher? Um, well, uh, him and uh, the, uh, his, the definitely the, the. Are we allowed to give spoilers at this point? We are. We are going to assume <clears throat> that everybody just binge this shit out of this. Yeah, show I right mean now. that prison fight scene is something else. Yeah, and I, I, I watched I, it three times now. I still. I also like the uh, the staircase, the stairwell fight. Oh in the, yeah, in the yeah, third yeah. Episode. Yeah. You know, it seems like they do that. Like third episode, we're gonna give you like a single take shot. That's it was the hallway in the first season. Mm -hmm. This one was the we're going down the staircase and people are yeah. coming from the side or from the front. We're all doing it in a single take, but we can all see the cuts because yeah. you know. We and know you know, know every works. show you do as a director, like somebody will bring up that fight scene, right? Mm -hmm. Or the sec the second episode in the first season. Yep. And the, you know, the one thing I think that people should really understand is that. You know, not, that show probably took a lot of time, particular for that fight. As mm -hmm. into the Badlands, for example, oh, yeah. it's a martial arts show, they took a lot of time. On other shows, <laughs> <laughs> where the fighting is not the main thing, you maybe have half a day. I just want people <laughs> to be aware of that. Like, there's for, for a good, people ask me all the time what makes a good fight scene. Well, it's the coverage and it's the time you mm -hmm. take. It's how long have the people rehearsed, the actors as well as the stunt people. Sometimes you don't even get the actors because they're so busy shooting because they're in every scene. So you have to do the whole fight with the stunt person, but when do you see the person's face? Mm -hmm. And then you have to like figure out, well, they don't really know the choreography. So it's a lot about, you know, it's the really the, the conditions and circumstances are not perfect for all the fights. And so I have actually learned to be slightly more forgiving now. Yeah, and it's also the, you know, most directors don't know how to shoot a fight scene, to sell a fight scene. You know, and, and I've always felt, and it's just a thing as a, as a dude who grew up watching kung fu movies and Jackie Chan, and I want to see the person doing the thing. Like, and I know it takes time. I know it takes forever to do that, but I need to sell me on it. You know, it's, what, it's one of the reasons why I, one of the many reasons why I didn't like the, the Star Wars prequels. <clears throat> because, you know, if you have CG robots fighting other CG robots, I don't give a shit. Like, yeah. that's, that's, beep, boop, beep, 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 we made a thing happen. Yeah. I want to see like actual people learning choreography. I want to see them doing it. I want to see them almost getting it. I want to see them getting it. I want to see Jackie Chan break a shin because he did something stupid that right. was amazing on screen. And it takes time. You know, like John Woo used to set up for months in those warehouses to do things like in the killer and hard boil because it takes right. months to execute that at that level, not seven days. <laughs> hey, you know, and that's, I mean, you for can't some, make the world in seven days, guys. Yeah, for some reason, I thought because you know, I I did a lot of stunt work in TV shows when I was still a stunt woman, and I did all the martial arts stuff, and and it never at that time seemed as if we were just being rushed. I don't know if it just gotten a higher pace, but 
you know, we we barely have time, and and, and it's also the, the lead actors barely have time to rehearse. This. There's simply not enough time uh, for them to shoot all the scenes they're in, as well as learn a fight. And that's in TV, I think, a real a real issue, um, which is is challenging. You know. Gotcha. All right. So before we let you go, hmm. what's next? What do you got? Um, well, I'm going on a show uh, called American Gothic. Mm -hmm. So I've graduated to, uh, I get to do grown-up shows now. <laughs> um, there's a superhero TV show that has called me. Mm. Uh, and I, I don't think I'm supposed, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to reveal it because I'm not sure if people know Okay. Even if I say that thing, I like I'm literally like I like this is <laughs> so close. But anyway, I you know, I'm I'm I think I'm gonna continue to be in the, the world of DC characters. I'm mm -hmm. hoping Marvel at some point will call and see if we can mm -hmm. warm a thing back up and you know. Well, I hear they have an Iron Fist show. <laughs> we need a whole other show to talk about that. Yeah. Well yeah. <laughs> But. Yeah. Well, okay. Or the Punisher show. I mean, or or yeah. the Punisher show, which, yeah. it, to be honest, they were idiots if they don't do. Like, the oh. response to that character is overwhelmingly strong. And, you know, you chase where the people come from. Yeah. You chase what they want. All right. We are going to let Lexi go back to her life of being fabulous and destroying fools on Twitter <clears throat> and breaking spines in real life. Can I just say one thing? Tell me if one thing. If Kevin Smith is not here the next time I'm coming, first of all, I'm coming back, but if Kevin <laughs> Smith is not here, I'm going to throw things. Okay. Listen, I don't want that to happen <laughs> because that could go incredibly badly for all parties concerned. So we'll make sure. Okay. Thank awesome. you. All right, guys. This has been another episode of Fat Man on Batman, minus the other fat man. It's just me, Mark Bernardin. Check me out, at Mark Bernardin on Twitter. That Kevin Smith, he's up in Toronto doing whatever he does. Say, so, hey, same bat time, same bat channel. www.youtube.com slash Kevin Smith. It's me, Kevin Smith. Thanks for watching. Do me a favor. Click that thing below that says subscribe. Every time you click that, you save a baby kitten from murder.